Hey, I'm Kendra Winchester and welcome back to my channel. And today I am going to be doing the last part in my Mrs. Dalloway read along. We have reached that stage. This is the last one. I know it's been fun, right? Like I've enjoyed reading through it and underlining it even more than it already is. Eventually I might just have to move to a different copy because there's so many underlines in this one. Uh, but before I get into that, I did want to tell you that if you enjoyed Mrs. Dalloway, obviously I'm going to recommend more of Virginia Woolf's work to you. Um, my favorite work of Virginia Woolf's is A Room of One's Own, which is creative nonfiction. So there's a lot of creativity in this nonfiction piece. She uses a lot of like what ifs and it, so it feels like a story, but it is a work of nonfiction. And creative nonfiction is what I studied and wanted to do in undergrad, so uh, I love this one. This is also underlined a lot. I own several copies of this one too. And if you want to look at other authors, I'm going to recommend Catherine Mansfield. She is a New Zealand author, one of the most famous New Zealand authors, and she was the only author that Virginia Woolf said she was jealous of, and most people paint them as uh, frenemies, like uh, that Virginia Woolf didn't really like her, but really they had a kinship. And Francine Prose mentions in the introduction to uh, the Mrs. Dalloway reader that Catherine Mansfield actually died during the writing of Mrs. Dalloway. Uh, so this one is, her style is very similar to Virginia Woolf's and Ali Smith actually did a lecture on Virginia Woolf and Catherine Mansfield, which I will link down below. Speaking of Ali Smith, I actually have to recommend this I just have to recommend all of her stuff to you because a lot of times her books feel like thematic retellings of Virginia Woolf uh, novels. So this one is um, The Accidental and it feels very much to me like To the Lighthouse, which is another one of my favorite of Virginia Woolf's novels. Uh, so that is definitely one that an author that you will want to check out. And the last recommendation I'm going to give you is The Hours by Michael Cunningham. This is a retelling of Mrs. Dalloway, and he actually has a piece in the Mrs. Dalloway Reader, which is what I've been reading some of my secondary resources from. So definitely check this out. It's also a movie with Meryl Streep and uh, Nicole Kidman and someone I can't remember, but all of them are award winners, and it's just fantastic. So that's it for the recommendations. Going to move those to the side now. So last time we ended with Septimus Warren Smith committing suicide by jumping over the railing, and that's where we were. So now that we know the, the end of the book, you've read the last 50 pages, I want to read you a, a part of an essay by Ian Forster. Ian Forster was part of the Bloomsbury group, so like this intellectual nerdy group uh, during the modernist era that Virginia and Leonard Wolf were a part of, and a lot of them were just really quirky individuals, but he, uh, Forster, actually wrote on Virginia, um, wrote essays, like um, literature, critical essays, whatever. Anyway, words are struggling today, so I'm going to read some of his. So he's talking about the book, the themes as a whole, and reading Mrs. Dalloway. And he says, quote, news of which comes to Clarissa of the suicide as she is giving an evening party. Does she likewise commit suicide? I thought she did the first time I read the book. Not at my second reading, nor is the physical act important, for she is certainly left with the full knowledge, inside knowledge, of what suicide is. The scientified lady and the obscure maniac are in sense the same person. His foot has slipped through the gay surface on which she still stands. That is all the difference between them. She returns, it would seem, to her party and to the man she loves, and a hint of her not new knowledge comes through to him as the London clock strikes three. Such, apparently, is the outline of this exquisite and superbly constructed book, and having made the outline, one must rub it out at once. For emphasis is fatal to understanding of this author's work. I really enjoy how he describes the slippery nature of interpreting one of Virginia Woolf's uh, novels. There is no singular reading of this book, I feel, that would just encapsulate it because it means several different layers. I remember I was working, I wrote about Virginia Woolf for my grad portfolio and reading about, uh, I think it's Lucy Briscoe in To the Lighthouse and every single like literary critic differed in their opinion of what she represented. And I find it very interesting, especially when you consider people of different times interpreting 
different books. So he was a contemporary of Virginia Woolf. Francine Prose, though, she talks about what she feels the book means. Francine Prose, who wrote the introduction to the Mrs. Dalloway Reader, she says, quote, because that is her true subject here, consciousness, awareness, action, and reaction. What we remember and say and keep hidden, the distance between the interior and the exterior, how very differently we appear to ourselves and to others. That's what she wants something, like what E.M. Forster said to her praise, her in praise of Jacob's room, further into the soul. So I find that interesting that Francine Pro Froze, Prose focuses on this interior like dialogue that these characters are having. And that is a beautiful part of Virginia Woolf's work. But one of the things that uh, I read an essay and I lost it somewhere on the internet, but they were talking about how it's very easy to focus on that inner dialogue of Virginia Woolf's characters and ignore the societal critiques that Virginia Woolf is making, which is what I really enjoy focusing on. Um, I really love studying gender in early modernist writings, uh, gender and sexuality. And so when I approached Virginia Woolf, uh, I looked at the relationships, the, her ideal relationships of, of like romantic or familial or uh, friendship. And it found that her ideal marriage is a more egalitarian one, which I think we see in Orlando. So when you understand that Virginia Woolf is seeking an equality of the mind, as we've talked about before, a room one's own, men should be man womanly and woman manly, uh, how we should both possess the qualities that were so strictly in her growing up in Victorian area time, so strictly uh, kept separate. That men were always this way and the ideal man was what every man should strive for and the ideal woman was what every woman should strive for. But in reality, it looks totally different than that. There are so many different uh, things that people can be. There aren't these strict ideas really anymore. So when she took, takes a look at gender, she is one of those early frontier kind of writers that is looking at this and saying that we as women can be so much more than men are telling us to be and men can be so much more than what they're saying they can be. And so that's something that we're going to look at a little bit here. Um, I love her party scenes. I love her dinner scenes. There's a dinner scene into the lighthouse, which is one of my favorite pieces of Virginia Woolf's writing. Uh, but we're going to look at a party scene here and it's beautiful. Now, if you struggled with this party scene because you get confused who's talking, imagine you're an invisible person and you're at this huge party, right? And you're walking through the crowd and you can hear people's thoughts. That is what basically you're doing. You're walking invisibly through this crowd and you're picking up thoughts from so-and-so, which connects to so-and-so's thoughts over here and then so-and-so's thoughts over here. And that's how the writing works. And I feel like it would be a perfect movie. It's almost as if you're following the camera, like walking through the crowd. I mean, you can hear different thoughts. It's one of the reasons why I love, love this, this writing. But before we get to the party, we have to return to Peter Walsh. Now, as I said, when we left, Dr. Holmes had just said, let her sleep. And so we get to Peter Walsh, who is going back to where he's staying at some sort of boarding house or hotel or something. And he is about to take dinner and then he's going to go, he's deciding if he wants to go to the party. He talks about, he says, quote, beauty of some sort probably in the way of the day, which beginning with his visit with Clarissa, which is the transition to talking about Clarissa. And he talks a lot about his feelings about Clarissa trying to work through what she is. On page 152, he says, quote, she was all that, so that to know her or anyone, one must seek out the people who completed them, even the places. Odd affinity she had with people and had never spoken to. Some women in the street, some man behind a counter, even trees or barns. It ended in transcendental theory, which with her horror of death allowed her to believe, or to say she believed, for all of her skepticism, that since our apparitions, the part of us which appears, are so momentary compared with the other, the unseen part of us, which spreads wide and unseen might survive, be recovered somehow, attached to this person or that, or even haunting certain places after death. Death. Perhaps, perhaps. We see that he's thinking about when you die, kind of like joining the cosmos. And we'll remember that in the very first 50 pages that we read, that Clarissa is walking through the street and imagining and hoping that when she dies, she will join the cosmos like this as well. Peter's continuing this idea. So if we were to take this basis that by dying or joining the cosmos. I think it makes a lot of sense taking that idea and applying it to Septimus because he's thinking about beauty. 
and he has these beautiful descriptions of the beauty that he seeks and almost wants to be a part of. And there's this idea that he has committed suicide to escape the horrors of his life to join the cosmos. Now, I have no idea really what Virginia believed. She was not religious in anything that I could tell. Uh, but this idea that you are kind of, I don't know, reaching equality with the universe is a very interesting one. And otherwise, there is not a lot of religious thought in Virginia Woolf's work other than to critique um, like organized religion as, as a whole. So I find it very interesting that there is a spiritual quality here. So back to Peter Walsh, he's thinking about this idea of joining the cosmos and thinking about death and what for Clarissa is at her heart. And he says here, he has a memory of her and he says, quote, uh, she had influence, she, Clarissa, had influenced him more than any person he had ever known. And always in this way, coming before him without his wish, wishing it, cool, ladylike, critical, or ravishing, romantic, recalling some field or English harvest. He saw her more often in the country, not in London. One scene after another important. He talks about how she tramped through the countryside and he's just thinking about who she is. We do know that the last perspective that we get in the book is Peter's, but I think we can actually see him working mentally through that, through this section. We see once again that on page 155 that he imagines that she's doing something. So we see in this paragraph um, on page 155 that starts to get that letter to him by six o'clock. She must have sat down and written it directly. And so he receives this letter that Clarissa sent him right after he left her house. And she, he's just reading it. She's reminding him of the party and different things. And he's imagining what it was like. So he says, she must have sat down and written it directly. He, he, it directly he left her stamped it, sent somebody to the post. It was, as people say, very like her. She was upset by his visit. She had felt a great deal, had for a moment when she kissed his hand, regretted, regretted, envied him, even remembered, possibly, for he saw her look it. Something he had said, how they could have changed the world if she'd married him, perhaps. Whereas it was this, it was middle age, it was mediocrity, then forced herself with her indomitable vitality to pull all that aside. And he imagines this is what she's feeling. We don't actually know if this is what she was feeling or if this is how it went down. This is just all in his head. And I think that we can see that. We talked about last time how Richard imagined Clarissa understanding him. And we saw before how Peter imagined that he understood Clarissa so well that she would communicate with him without words. And I think that we often do this as well as people we imagine that this is what's going on. X person has not called me back, so obviously they must not like me or something, you know, that's really simplistic, but I think that we can see that as well. So we see this through, and we've talked about how Peter Walsh was always trying to be the ideal man, how him uh, messing with his pocket knife is a thinly veiled sexual reference uh, to his manhood, but also uh, a commenter a second um but also secondary resource i read said that they thought it was him being indecisive but about his masculinity which i think combines a lot of different ideas that commenters that you guys have had um and i think that you could definitely read that in this and it says here he's talking about his own masculine nature and on page 156 it says it quote it was this that made him attractive to women who liked the sense that he was not altogether manly and down the page quote he was a man but not the sort of man one had to respect which was a mercy not like major simmons for instance not in the least like that daisy thought when in spite of her two children she used to compare them now daisy is the woman that he's fallen in love with who has two children um and it's commented actually that if she actually went with peter she'd lose her children i think we often forget that at the time children belonged to the man not the mom which was obviously problematic so right before he gets to the party we see his final thoughts before going to see clarissa again he says on page 164 the brain must wake now the body must contract now entering the house the lighted house with the door stood open where the motor cars were standing and the bright women descending the soul must have brave itself in to endure he opened the big blade of his pocket knife and so he we walk in and we see a lot of uh, discussion of the party like i said we're moving through the different party scenes and different things. And Clarissa is greeting people and she's talking about the different things of the party. We see one of the servants talking about all of the different people there. And she talks about how it's extraordinary how Peter put her into these states just by coming and standing in a corner on page 168. 
so she talks a lot, about, a lot about the party and about greeting people. And it says here on page 170 that Clarissa, every time she gave a party, she had this feeling of being something not herself. And it's something that Peter has pointed out that when Clarissa began to go with Richard and to like date him essentially, um, and then she married him, that she seemed to become a different person. She seemed to finally, instead of reading books and talking about them with Sally of Peter, she became more of a society woman. And that is something that I think she's feeling here when she's giving the party. Now finally, on page 171, we see that she finally, finally, finally is meeting Sally Seton again. Now, when I was first reading this, this was the moment I was waiting for because her relationship with Sally really captivated me in how we don't get Sally's perspective. At the very end here, while she's talking with Peter, we do get some of her perspective, but we never see that Summer at Borton from her perspective. She is the only one of the four primary characters in this weird love shape that we do not get that Summer's perspective from. We get a few insights, but not a full like walking through the street kind of deal. And I find that interesting that oftentimes with the movement of the mind, Virginia Woolf has paired walking through the street, but I guess that's another conversation for another day. So we see that Clarissa is thinking about Sally. On page 171, it says, quote, yet it was extraordinary to see her again, older, happier, less lovely. They kissed each other, first this cheek, then that, by the drawing room door, and Clarissa turned with Sally's hand in hers and saw her rooms full, heard the roar of voices, saw the candlesticks, the blowing curtains, and the roses which Richard had given her. I have five enormous boys, said Sally. She had the simplest egotism, the most open desire to be the thought first always, and Clarissa loved her for being still like that. I can't believe it, she cried, kindling all over with pleasure at the thought of the past. Now we know that Clarissa has struggled not with the, not being able to feel the passion she did in her youth, and so the fact that she is finally feeling this when Sally appears gives us hope. So we see that Peter has arrived, Sally's arrived, but then Krista is drawn off to talk to other people of society and be basically, you know, a hostess. So we see that Peter is still very much in love with her. And we see that he's constantly telling himself, but he was not in love. We know that he's obsessed with her, that he is indeed in love with her. And I find this a beautiful section where he describes Clarissa. So we're in Peter's head and he says on page 174, quote, she wore earrings and a silver green mermaid's dress, lolloping on the waves and braiding her tresses she seemed, having that gift still to be, to exist, to sum it all up in the moment as she passed, turned, caught her scarf in some other woman's dress and hitched it, laughed, all with the most perfect ease and the air of a creature floating in its element. He's describing her as this mythical mermaid, this beautiful creature, almost like a siren temptress that we see more in classical mythology. She also describes her as like her age as taken part of her through the rest of the paragraph. And so it says at the very end, so she made him think and he's still thinking about her. So we go back to Clarissa and we see that she's avoiding Peter, she's avoiding Sally, and she's talking to different people and she finally starts talking to Lady Bruton. Now remember, Lady Bruton is the lady that would have men over for luncheon. She had more masculine interests in politics and different things. Um, and so she, and there's that big long paragraph about how she and these men's wives don't really get along. And so we have this section here on page 179. Now we're in Lady Bruton's head and she says, Though she liked her, she had lots of fine qualities, but they had nothing in common, she and Clarissa. It might have been better if Richard had married a woman with less charm. Who would have helped him more in his work? He had lost his chance at the cabinet. So then we go to page 180, and we're still in Lady Bruton's head, and she says, quote, For she never spoke of England, but this Isle of Men, this dear, dear land, was in her blood, without reading Shakespeare. And if ever a woman could have worn the helmet and shot the arrow, could have led troops to attack, ruled with indomitable justice, barbarian hordes, and lain under a shield, noseless in a church, or made a green grass mound of some primeval hillside, that woman was Millicent Bruton debarred by her sex and some truancy too of the logical faculty. She found it impossible to write a letter to the times. She had the thought of empire always at hand and acquired from her association with that armored goddess, her ramard bearing, her robustness of demeanor, so that one could not figure her even in death parted from the earth or roaming territories over which in some spiritual shape she, <laughs> some spiritual shape, the Union Jack had ceased to fly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll die here. 
to be not England, even among the dead. No, no, impossible. She is so funny. Like, I love her. You could tell that Virginia Woolf is having fun here in her writing and I just think that is so hilarious like you know Americans are supposed to be like the uber patriotic like obsessives but this woman really just what is 4th of July what no we're all about England here it just makes me laugh because I like I know people like this for America so anyway so we see that she is still avoiding Peter and Sally and she says on page 182 a part of this Sally must always be Peter must always be but she must leave them. And it's this idea of her leaving behind her youthful passions and desires and really the two great loves of her life to take her place in society. And I feel like this is definitely continuing that critique on the societal woman and what society's ideal woman was at the time that, you know, she had to be, you know, on this pedestal, the angel of the house. So then we see on page 183 that she learns that a man has killed himself and that she is really distraught by this. And I think this is the moment that Ian Forster is talking about. And it says on page 184, quote, the party splendor fell to the floor. So strange it was to come in alone in her finery. What business had the Bradshaws to talk of death at her party? A young man had killed himself and they talked of it at her party. The Bradshaws talked of death. He had killed himself, but how? Always her body went through it first when she was told suddenly of an accident. Her dress flamed, her body burnt. He had thrown himself from a window, up had flashed the ground. Through him, blundering, bruising, went the rusty spikes. There he lay with a thud, thud, thud in his brain, and then a suffocation of blackness. So she saw it. But why had he done it? And the Bradshaws talked of it at her party. Down the page, quote, but this young man had killed himself. Had he plunged, holding his treasure? If it were now to die, twere now to be most happy, she had said to herself once coming down in white. And that is a reference back to when she's coming down the stairs to meet Sally in particular. And then she talks about the poets and thinkers and you can see her working through this mentally. And this is the moment for her when we see that E.M. Forrester is talking about what Virginia Woolf is talking about in her own introduction to the book, that she is just a double of Septimus, that she herself is just one step away from being like Septimus, that she is not fulfilling her role in society or does not want to, and it is putting pressure on her in that she can't maintain this facade that she has kept maintaining, and that she is so charming and beautiful and perfect. And it says here on page 185, quote, Then she had felt it only this morning. There was the terror, the overwhelming incapacity, one's parents giving it into one's hands, this life, to be lived to the end, to be walked with serenely. There was in the depths of her heart an awful fear. She must have, down the page, she must have perished, but with the young man, had killed himself. And she ponders this and keeps thinking about it. And she talks about the young man on, on page 186 she says the young man had killed himself but she did not pity him down the page quote she felt somehow very like him the young man who had killed himself she felt glad that he had done it thrown it away the clock was striking the leaden circles dissolved in the air he made her feel the beauty he made her feel the fun but she must go back she must assemble she must find sally and peter so here we see that she is realizing that she needs Sally and Peter in her life, that they are the beauty, the passion of life that she is missing from her own life. She must go find them. She must find these two figures that represent so much to her. And this is something that I think has really clicked for me this time around in that she has so much invested in the two of them. We see through this next section that Peter and Sally are sitting together waiting for, for Clarissa, that she is waiting, that they are waiting together, that they are united in their love of Clarissa and the fact that she had chosen neither of them. And it says on page 188, quote, Oh, Clarissa, said Sally. What Sally felt was simply this. She had owed Clarissa an enormous amount. They had been friends, not acquaintances, friends. And she still saw Clarissa all in white going about the house with her hands full of flowers. To this day, tobacco plants made her think of Borton. But did Peter understand? She lacked something. Lacked what was it? She had charm. She had extraordinary charm, but to be frank, and she felt that Peter was an old friend, a real friend. Did absence matter? Did distance matter? She had often wanted to write. And it goes on. To be quite frank then, how could Clarissa have done it? 
married Richard Dalloway, a sportsman, a man who cared only, cared only for dogs. Literally, when he came into the room, he smelled of stables. And then all this, she waved her hand. She and, she and Peter are wondering why on earth did she choose this? And it continues down throughout, and you can see them discussing this. You can see them discussing her throughout the rest of the book, coming to terms with. There's a lot in between uh, Sally and Peter that we could talk about, but not enough time, guys. This is a beautiful section. Top of page 192, it says, All the time he was thinking only of Clarissa and was fidgeting with his knife. He had not found life simple, Peter said. His relations with Clarissa had not been simple. It had spoiled his life, he said he said. We see here on the page down on the page 192 that that Sally even though she's had five strapping sons she has fulfilled her job as a woman she still reads plays we see that at the bottom of 192 she'd read a, she'd read a wonderful play about a man who scratched on the wall of his cell and then we get to the final page. Now this final page we folk we see Richard is looking at Elizabeth and that he looks that he's thinking oh who is that wonderful girl in her pink frock and he turns she turns around it's wonderful Elizabeth. He looked at his daughter and you know, what a lovely girl. And so we see the last part of the novel. We see on page 194, quote, Richard had improved. You are right, said Sally. I shall go and talk to him. I shall say good night. What does the brain matter, said Lady Rossiter, getting up, compared to the heart? I will come, said Peter, but he sat on for a moment. What is this terror? What is this ecstasy, he thought to himself. What is it that fills me with extraordinary excitement? It is Clarissa, he said, for there she was. And that is the end of Mrs. Dalloway. And in true modernist fashion, it's an ambiguous ending and you don't know if he sees her across the room or if you see her coming towards him. Ultimately, Clarissa has a choice to make. She can choose to go and have Peter and, you know, Sally back in her life. It might possibly be too late for her to do that and she might end up like Septimus or she could just continue to try to struggle to maintain this facade that she has had throughout her life. And I think that this is just a beautiful thing that Virginia has left to the reader for us to decide. We see that Peter has figured out what brings excitement to his life and there she is. And I think that's just a beautiful end. And, you know, when I first read this book, Peter still admittedly still kind of, he, he pretty much creeps me out. But if you view him as this man who's trying to figure out what gives him most passion, what is the love of his life, and it is Clarissa. And she has rejected him because she has chosen Richard because that is what is expected. And I think that when you think about through that and what Peter and Sally represent together for Clarissa, it's such a beautiful image of it is Clarissa and there she was. And you in your head decide okay what's going to happen after the book and I think that's why Ian Forster said that that's what he thought happened to Clarissa at the end of the book you as the reader decide what you think happened and I think that's a beautiful thing it can be very frustrating admittedly if you know you wanted a definite ending but she leaves it open and I feel like that is definitely reflective of Clarissa and the choices that she's made. So that is Mrs. Dalloway. And I hope you've enjoyed this walkthrough. Um, I have learned so much going through this. And again, there's so much that we could talk about, like the flower imagery, the foils of the different women and lining them up and the foils of the different men through Richard and lining them up and just so many different things. But again, this has already been like two hours of walkthrough, so went combined. So I think that's enough for now. Um, if you love to talk more about Mrs. Dalloway, definitely check out the discussion group over on Goodreads or just comment down in the comments down below. And yeah, I thank you so much for watching this and joining on Mrs. Dalloway read along. So I guess that's it from me. Thank you for watching and happy reading. Bye guys.